Our esteemed speaker this evening has 25 plus years of tech leadership experience. Please welcome the CTO and co-founder of Arrows, Spike, Brian Bukowski. It's such a warm welcome. Um, anyone here who was at uh, the meetup, Eric's meetup, where I presented a few months ago? Yes. So I don't know where the fire alarms are. <laughs> uh, I checked around. I don't think there are any fire alarms, and there are no sprinklers. And given that I grew up in Oakland, that's a little concerning. But you know, <laughs> uh, let me ask one. Um, uh, one, uh, there are fire extinguishers. So those of you who are fire extinguisher trained, I am, will be in good shape. Uh, one trivia question. What is Aerospike's largest dollar value customer currently? Uh, Nexus. No. They're our first customer, so they don't pay us that much. <laughs> Any other guesses? Nielsen? Oracle. Oh. Oracle is a huge customer through their acquisition of Blue Kai and uh, another company, Oracle Marketing Cloud, runs on Aerospike. Okay, so um, how many of you have heard of Aerospike? No Aerospike, use Aerospike. Okay, so I am going to quickly go through just an overview of Aerospike before we get into uh, machine learning with Aerospike with Nielsen Marketing Cloud. At uh, 7.30, Brent, uh, Brent Ketor from uh, Nielsen will be joining us. We'll be able to do questions and answers, stuff like that. He'll be able to answer a lot of your machine learning questions about how Nielsen uses uh, machine learning, which is the point of the talk. So first of all, what is it? It's database, distributed database, no SQL. Uh, as mentioned before, written in C, really focuses on the key value problem. So if you are using a distributed database for key value access, if you're using, say, Redis, and you want to scale more, if you're using Cassandra, and you're tired of a huge <coughs> number of servers, uh, if you're using uh, Mongo, and you're, uh, it's kind of slow for you, uh, you might want to check out Aerospike. Um, main use of Aerospike is you know, ad tech, certainly. Um, the general pattern of using Aerospike is the case where you've got something like an app server that's going to be doing a lot of real-time decisioning, it's going to be doing real-time <laughs> analytics, uh, pricing, advertisement analytics, uh, stuff like that. And in those cases, what you want is a really high-performance NoSQL, but all of this is on the front edge, right? So there's a whole bunch of users out here, there's the internet out here. We're not exactly an analytics database, right? I expect in the, most of our customers, we have a tier of uh, you know, true warehouse in the back that's often HDFS and Hadoop based. Those things are doing your quantitative analysis, that's what your actual data scientist runs. But how are you going to get all those insights onto the internet in a moment by moment basis? You're going to pour that into a very fast key value store. And also that's a place where you can put all of that user data. So all of the recent behavior by users would go in a fast key value system that's capable of terabytes. That's really the advertising use case, is a massive profile store. So when you need 5 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion user records, this is the kind of tool that you would look for. Um, we're also used, uh, I'll talk through a couple of other use cases. One question I get asked is, uh, but Brian, I don't have 5 million transactions per second, why would I use Aerospike? And the answer's down here. So, if I, um, uh, and this, this case is taken from a very large West Coast payment processor. So a very large West Coast payment processor processes about 500 credit card swipes per second and has a 750 millisecond uh, fraud or no fraud, go no go, window, at which point they can say, hey, yeah, pay this guy or don't pay this guy, we think it's fraud. If you're doing a credit card transaction, it turns out these guys determined they wanted 5,000 data points to go into that fraud calculation. 5,000 data points, that's recent IP addresses, recent behavior of users, recent market basket, things uh, bought and sold in that particular store. All of that, it turns out, are uh, reasonable features to add to a fraud detection calculation. So if you really want to touch 5,000 data points, read those, well, then you're going to need millions of transactions per second. So hopefully that sort of makes real for you the kind of cases where you're going to want a large key value store. And this is the uh, core example behind that kind of fraud prevention case. What I like about fraud is where there's money, there's fraud. So all the ad networks that we've used and we've uh, deployed on 
They all essentially are doing forms of fraud detection as well. They're doing things like bot detection, right? If you see a whole bunch of data points, it might be a bot. And it might be someone who's, uh, uh, or a fraudulent website, that's in fact presenting a lot of uh, requests uh, saying that someone has clicked on a particular ad. Um, so in these kinds of cases, you've got uh, an overall millisecond range, so there's a defined period of computation. There's a whole bunch of behavior that you want to fold into a computation. You'll see how this feeds into machine learning as well. Um, those of you who are familiar with Cassandra, Cassandra, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, we do replace a lot of Cassandra these days. Um, we don't support SQL, but Cassandra is often used as a key value store for uh, these exact kinds of use cases. And what we found in general was uh, we put a pretty big effort into putting together some benchmarks. And I don't really expect you to trust benchmarks that we created, but we did put together a 20-page reproduction scenario that allows you to go and run the benchmarks yourself in your own area. But what we found in general is Cassandra tends to be CPU limited, right? And so Aerospike written in C, written more efficiently, and optimized for Flash, gets you this kind of uh, response rate so this is uh, throughput. What you notice about it is that it's in a very small band, whereas Cassandra tends to fluctuate a huge amount. So if what you're looking for in a database is a really uh, tight reason, uh, response time and a predictable amount of performance, um, Aerospike is a pretty good choice. One thing I do often uh, bring up with this is um, an interesting thing that came out of our uh, benchmarking is an expected uh, but uh, really visually interesting point, which is this is about the half hour mark. So if you're testing a database, Aerospike does it too, right? We slow down a little bit as defragmentation kicks in, and that gets you from this kind of latency to this kind of latency. With Cassandra, it's far more pronounced. So what I, what I suggest is, if you're doing your own database benchmarking, you really gotta go beyond the half hour mark when you're doing these tests. A lot of people get fooled, and then as they start going into production, they find they need a lot more servers. So regardless of your database, go beyond half the half hour mark. Okay, so let's talk about online machine learning. So uh, these two guys uh, work for Nielsen Marketing Cloud. If you know Nielsen, uh, Nielsen of course is a household name, um, but they, uh, Nielsen acquired a company called Exalate. How many of you have heard of Exalate? No Exalate? Okay, a few in the front here. Um, so, Exalate uh, has been a longtime Aerospike user and in the typical ad tech use case. So they store a huge amount of profile data that they have uh, collected across the internet and they use it for advertising optimization uh, as an ad network. Uh, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, Brent will be coming by uh, at 5.30, assuming he doesn't get frozen or something. Uh, and, and this, these, yes? He's going to Okay. How's, is that better? Much better. Much better? Sorry about that. Okay, and so this is a webinar that I recorded with these guys, and you can actually go and hear them say the whole this whole thing in their words. So the slides are, um, I'm unchanged, and I'm gonna try to go through uh, basically the big points of their presentation to try to explain to you a bit about how Nielsen does machine learning for fun and profit. So the entire problem in advertising related to machine learning really comes around building audiences. So those of you who work in ad tech uh, and work in behavioral analytics know that you don't really have enough information about an individual user to predict their behavior. A single user is not really statistically significant. You need a whole bunch of users, hundreds of users, hundreds of thousands of users to really uh, form any basis of prediction. And then you can see, well, this, the, a few users have moved in this way, therefore a particular advertisement might be uh, useful. So the way Nielsen does it is they allow individual advertisers for individual campaigns to pick what they call high value seeds. So these are individual people using user records that they think are going to perform well in that particular advertising campaign. What they use machine learning for is taking these high value seeds and taking it to an extended audience that will be statistically significant, allowing them to do uh, prediction. So multiply. Multiply, sure. Easier. 
characterize that as look like modeling? Sorry? Would you characterize that as look like modeling? Uh, I wouldn't because they're using machine learning, so they're not using sort of a standard pattern of, you know, just uh, of behavioral look-alike, but you could. I mean, they are, in fact, looking for people like this, except it's machine learning. So it's, uh, the way they call it is this idea of a seed, and then these seeds create a larger number of people. What you'll see about this is it's an online model. And the point of, and uh, online in this case doesn't mean, you know, it's on the internet. It means it's live and it's changing. So what's interesting about the machine learning technique when you're doing audience analytics is the audience might change hour by hour by hour. It may, in fact, not even contain these people anymore. So for that reason, I really wouldn't call it lookalike. And feel free to shout out questions. Um, how do you find a high value C? Well, that's a good question. Um, what, they, what they do is uh, when you are creating an advertising campaign in the Nielsen platform, you literally pick people. So you have a menu, from what I understand, where you can actually select a person like this and a person like that, and you see sets of behavior. Is it based on demographics? I don't think so. This is a great question for Brent. So uh, I haven't used their platform. Um, but the interesting part about it is they're currently running, uh, they run as a matter of course, around 35,000 to 40,000 campaigns at any given time. 35,000 to 40,000 campaigns. Each one of those campaigns, uh, when you create the campaign, you get to pick this small high value seed audience and then it modifies over time. But how do they know if that person is gonna work for them? They don't. Um, part of this is about monitoring. So what happens is, what they do is they do this and they start extending the audience and they don't, uh, as far as I remember, they don't uh, take the campaign live until it performs to a certain level. Oh, okay. And then they have to continually monitor it because just because it's behaving well in, for some number of hours doesn't mean it's going to continue to behave well. That's sort of one of the outcomes of machine learning, right? It's a little more random, a little more chaotic than other, other systems. So there's a whole bunch of slides, and again, Brent can answer some questions about the kind of monitoring they do. But in general, you're doing performance monitoring, right? Am I getting the right number of clicks? Am I getting the right number of conversions? <laughs> One thing we know about machine learning is you need to have a metric and an optimization function in order for machine learning to work. The good news about this is if your audience is performing well, it's because your advertising uh, campaign is performing well. So uh, things like CPM models, CPC models, are what you're gonna use, as opposed to brand, right? Brand has no immediate measurement function. So this is all about CPC, CPM uh, um, type campaigns. I guess they do like A-B test, control expose, and just apply that to Perhaps. No. So um, the way they think about this is that there really is a feedback cycle, because it isn't about creating a audience up front and then just uh, waiting for the uh, campaign to perform. Really, they think about the idea that they're gathering a set of data to begin with about behavior. They're building an initial model, that's that um, audience set that occurs before it goes live. They have to validate that model, deploy it, score the responses, monitor performance, and then continue, which means they're constantly redeploying model, models and validating models. And that's the essence of online machine learning, is you're constantly rescoring, you're constantly doing new models. So uh, in 2012, these guys were pretty early into machine learning. Uh, the uh, uh, XLA uh, mach uh, machine learning group is based out of Israel, out of Tel Aviv. As far as I can tell, it's mostly ex-Israeli military folks. You know, there's a very strong uh, uh, math and uh, machine learning component there. And that's essentially what they were doing back in 2012. Only 30 to 40 models. So what happened back then was an individual advertiser could pick between one of 30 or 40 different models when they're, uh, sorry, 30 to 40 different audiences when taking an advertisement online. Then what they wanted to do was move up to a lar much larger number of audiences and then past 2015 actually having tens of thousands of audiences. What do you mean by a model here? Um, a model, what I mean by a model is the machine learning concept of a model, which is a, um, a set, basically it's a matrix, 
matrix representation where you do a set of math and it uh, incorporates being able to score out a particular set of behaviors. So it is really the math that represents the audience at any given time. So if you have a class of audience, then you would be fitting to this particular model? No, no, the model will end up defining the audience. Ah. So you've got all of the people in the world and then the model is a set of math that says these guys are, this guy is in, this guy is out, this guy is in, this guy is out. Yeah. When you say this based on, on behavior, is this mostly online behaviors? Yes. People going to certain websites, clicking certain yes. parts of websites and stuff? So this, this is all about on, and this is the other kind of online. This is the online which is to say the internet. So all of this is internet behavior. So the question is, is this being uh, applied in non-internet advertising? Yes. And the short answer is, I don't know. Um, I believe that uh, because there's a real-time component here and a behavioral component where you have to associate online behavior to, say, a set-top box streaming event, I don't know if they're capable of doing that yet. In your estimation, do you think this gives you a more accurate <coughs> picture of an audience versus using a traditional format? Um, so uh, what, what Brent and the Exolate guys say is that they believe they have about a 20% better um, uh, result rate than using standard techniques. Um, what they'll also say if you listen to the webinar is that some audiences and some advertising campaigns show no benefit in using online modeling. And so uh, if you use offline, if you use static techniques, it's just fine. But there are some audiences, some campaigns, some products where there's a fast moving change in demand and that can be modeled, uh, uh, the shifting audience that can occur will give much better results. So you said something like with brands and effectiveness, so like would a media planner be with like a brand and then what is an example, if it's not a brand, what is an example of a client that would use a model um, which then undercuts the media planner and you know, so then you have like this form, this model first, and then you have um, so I think the answer, and again this might be a better Brent question, is the media planner, this is a little more dynamic, but essentially the media planner advertising buyer uses the Exolate tool chain. So that's the person who picks those seeds, they have, an uh, they have a campaign that they're running over a course of weeks, so the media planner, media buyer does that. But they don't do it in a static way, right? Because they have to continually monitor this, they have to you know, sort of check in with the website to make sure that um, uh, it's continuing to perform. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is this doesn't exactly undercut that. Okay. Um, my, and, uh, my point about brand is um, uh, when you have performance-oriented advertising, which is to say CPC, CPM types, uh, you have something you can feed into the model on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Brand advertising, which is just you know uh, put up Coke in front of this set of people, mm -hmm. you can't measure that. So uh, you can't measure it immediately. You have to use uh, much more uh, delayed uh, term forms of uh, brand management. Um, so that's not appropriate. Thank but uh, yeah. Do the models also take into account uh, uh, any geolocation, like where people go, where they're located? I'm know. sure it does. Um, however, that's part of their secret sauce. Um, and I'll t um, let, me, let me get through a couple more slides here. That one's kind of boring. Um, so uh, the first thing that they want to really uh, drive home here is a lot of people think that this kind of audience analysis can be done and should be done in batch mode. So if you're used to using things like MLlib and you have some huge <coughs> swath of data, you can in fact run MLlib or uh, different things over your entire data set and get one audience at the beginning of time. However, online machine learning, those models, though those audiences are changing. What they said is that they do uh, 100 element micro batches. So once they get about 100 uh, different behaviors stored up, they will basically retrain. So uh, if you're using libraries that are using batches, in some sense they're still using batches, right? But they're not using 24 hour batches, they're using 100 element batches, which have a, uh, I think a, a one to five second lifetime. So every one to five seconds, they're retraining and moving forward those models. So that's why they make it like evolution. Um, I have another customer out of San Francisco. They basically say the same thing. They say that online really works better. 
I was at a presentation, uh, QCon San Francisco by Google's TensorFlow group. Basically, they just, they just started with, of course you're using online machine learning. So anyone who is used to the TensorFlow platform, they store their models in a distributed fashion, and everything is online. So uh, part of this slideshow is uh, uh, from, from the Nielsen guys is um, uh, really the benefits of online. Um, but a lot of the folks I talk to, they're already working with online, and that's sort of a foregone conclusion. <clears throat> so what does their data flow look like? And what are the advantages of doing online? It's not just about better performance. It turns out that with, uh, with Batch, you end up needing to take these large chunks of data and move them back and forth. So you end up building your full data platform, your HDFS style platform, on the back end and a portion of it on the front end. Now you've got two pieces of data to manage. Um, you have to be able to have that large scale data storage and you end up doing these massive, massive batch jobs that take hours and hours. So uh, the way they um, compare this is they say, uh, hey look, online is just simpler. You're gonna need all of that audience data on the front edge anyway. You're gonna have to build that platform on the front edge. You might as well just do your audience training there. If you do that, it's a simpler platform, it's easier to build, and oh, by the way, the results are more effective because the models are updating more frequently and updating to changes in behavior on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis. Um, so this is part of the stuff I don't understand because um, I don't actually know that much about machine learning. And so stochastic gradient descent is uh, one of the simpler forms of machine learning. So they're not using something like ConvNet. Uh, ConvNets are typically used for uh, high frequency pattern detection in, in uh, visual detection. Uh, and you can ask some questions from, for Brent if, if this stuff is of interest. Uh, but the most important thing is, again, real time and micro batches. Ow. <coughs> so the first thing that, that uh, these guys were Aerospike users uh, from back in, I think, 2011, 2012. The first thing you do need is you need an online data store for, you're here. Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> you snuck in. <laughs> You want to explain this slide? <laughs> uh, we can go back. <laughs> okay, if you have any questions, you'll have to answer. Yeah. Um, so the first thing you need with um, <clears throat> is a store for your user data. <clears throat> this generally will have days, <clears throat> if not weeks, worth of behavior, but it doesn't need a lot more. It's not your data warehouse. It doesn't need to have you know years and years worth of data like you would have to build in a batch system. The amount of data is going to be determined, the timeline of data will end up being determined by your data scientists. They will know how much sort of replay and how much backlog you're gonna need. Um, but essentially this was uh, what they ended up with, uh, first for their uh, non-machine learning audience system, uh, but then in general, which is they're taking in about uh, 10 billion events and they've got about 300 uh, server nodes, Aerospike server nodes. Uh, the modeling cluster then is much smaller because all they really need is, uh, say, uh, 30 to 40,000 models. Each model is about five megabytes in size. Um, now, an interesting uh, point, so let me sort of go into a little sidebar here uh, that I actually learned with a different machine learning uh, customer, is one of the key necessities to this cluster is to be able to have rollback capability. So you need to be basically checkpoint your models as they move forward. Um, now this is part of the monitoring thing we'll discuss uh, in a few more slides. But what happens with machine learning models is it's kind of like a human and it become, can become traumatized by bad data or uh, different weird inputs and essentially campaigns uh, can just go off the rails. And this has something to do with the somewhat non-deterministic math behind machine learning. When you start seeing these things go sideways, especially across a large number of your campaigns, you uh, start suggesting some data insufficiencies or technical problems, you have to be able to quickly, uh, well, first of all, sort out your data problem, but then also be able to roll back to known good states of those different models. Because otherwise, uh, essentially what happens is those models end up learning something about data insufficiency, and they may never recover or may take weeks if not months to recover. And I did have a customer that had this problem and did not, in fact, was not using proper checkpointing in their models and ended up having uh, poorly performing campaigns for weeks and weeks. 
until um, uh, they've essentially started resetting a lot of their models. You agree? Yeah. Checkpoint, really important. <clears throat> so uh, that user data store, uh, here's some specs of the servers. What you can see is it's built for not particularly high-end systems, but it is you know, data center grade systems. Uh, a fair amount of memory. Um, Aerospike built, is built with a lot of flash, so those are uh, some of the more uh, high performance flash drives that are out there today. Those are not NVMe drives, um, but they are still pretty fast uh, 1.2 terabyte drives. And you can see that there's a lot <laughs> per server. So uh, that's one way to get a lot of throughput out of SSD drives, is to really pack a huge number in per chassis. Now this system, you can see, it really doesn't have to do quite as much. It's not doing every single user behavior, and it's just storing those five megabyte chunks. So uh, they only needed uh, nine servers um, and uh, just one SSD per machine. Okay, so um, ongoing data cleaning, we talked about ongoing validation, very important. Automatic fe feature selection is also an interesting point. Want to help me out? Sure. Um, I think up there. Come on, Mike. Uh, sorry, hold you a second. Um, everybody, I'm Brent Peter from uh, Nielsen. Must be able to hear you. I need a mic. Close your mouth, please. Hello. Hey everybody, I'm, my name is Brent Cater, I'm with uh, Nielsen Nielsen Marketing Cloud. We, uh, we were, I was part of uh, x late prior to acquisition by Nielsen, and we've been kind of with uh, Aerospike uh, about that time, we're starting to develop a bit more and more. Um, just to kind of, Brian's done a great job, he definitely um, kind of been spot on with all the uh, information, but um, just to kind of continue on and not break uh, stream with this, the uh, kind of the, the extreme uh, framework is Essentially, what we're talking about is is, is taking our existing uh, framework that we had for uh, ingesting data and modeling it, what we're using for the batch style, and just leveraging the same infrastructure, and, and that way we don't have to build a separate infrastructure that we have to kind of stuff the data to or a new infrastructure to um, actually model <coughs> the data lab. So Extreme is kind of what our homegrown application. It's a Java-based application. We use uh, Wildfly in it. The, uh, the, they're very small J group clusters. Um, essentially, I'm trying to look from what in the presentation, but um, but yeah, it's just it's just this is kind of just talking about you know what we already have in place, and then we're just essentially leveraging what's in place, and then putting machine learning on top of it by leveraging the back end of the Aerospike. So there's nine servers that are three servers in separate geo locations that we're keeping updated by using XDR. So this uh, th this makes uh, sort of a lot of the data flow a little clearer. Um, so you've got this essentially this classification engine out front. You've got that user behavior coming in. Um, the first thing, as I remember, is you have some. You do have to do some data set filtering that I believe is somewhat manual, right? You have uh, essentially some rules on that front side. Yeah, I mean, you're trying to find an audience. I mean, and you're trying to figure out what attributes are associated with that audience, whether it's positive or negative. I mean, you find out if they, you know, they are Toyota buyers. These are the ones that always convert into actually purchasing whatever. You're, you're selling, whatever the publisher is interested in. So you kind of have to figure out what attributes are associated. So you, you figure out you know, kind of a, a seed level, and you figure out what's converted and non-converted based on building that, that initial audience to kind of train through your set. <coughs> so now, uh, feature selection though. So uh, those of you who are um, uh, somewhat new to uh, machine learning, what feature means is that those kinds of things like uh, source IP address, uh, geographic, like you mentioned before, these are all uh, features that you uh, find through the machine learning process. An interesting point about the uh, x system, uh, Nielsen system, excuse me, is that this is in fact uh, controlled by machine learning as well, right? Yep. Yeah. So often in uh, a lot of the systems that I've seen before, this is actually done manually. You end up saying, well, this particular audience we believe is going to respond to uh, a geographic uh, analysis, this audience isn't. Uh, but in fact, they weight a bunch of these factors um, automatically. Yeah, I mean, it's all in what you set for your confidence level and your accuracy. So you can essentially train your set if you want to have a bigger lot uh, overlap or audience section, then you can you know reduce your confidence level with the level of accuracy you want in it. But it's fine tuning it as it's it's running and learning more and more about what the happening in and for each data center for when we're adjusting traffic. You're relying on cookie matching and, and geolocation. Correct, correct, yeah. And we establish that unique uh, user ID, and that's 
what's replicated and established um, in each one of the aerospike clusters. Another question? This could be used for any industry, right? I'm sorry, what's that? This could be used to mine data for any industry? Yeah, yeah. It, it should be limited. Well, which ones are you thinking of? Yeah. Investor data, consumer mm -hmm. data, and travel data. Yeah. Um, part, of, part of what this is about is uh, doing that uh, data amplification. So in any case where you have a variety of sources, a la users, so um, financial services, do you want to be able to find uh, individual stock tickers uh, in, or individual um, uh, assets that are slow moving and you don't really have enough data? You want to be able to combine individual assets into pools um, that would be a, a, in order to do prediction because you don't have enough data for an individual one. Same problem. What about data to predict what stocks were um, You don't necessarily need audience selection, but you can use machine learning for sure. Um, what kind of like machine? What kind of like machine learning model you are using for the feature selection? It's like uh, support vector machine, uh, logistic regression. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I get. Uh, um, so, um, so just to step things back, I'm in charge of the infrastructure here. Kevin is also one of our data scientists who is going to uh, be a little more involved in that. But yeah, okay. I can get back to you. Um, but but that is but it is one of the interesting points. In fact, I gave a bunch of these slides in Japan a couple weeks ago, and the one guy who was doing exactly this was not getting the same kind of results these guys were. And so he basically said he wasn't getting uh, uh, any benefit out of online machine learning. Uh, probably because he wasn't using the right kind of model selection. So there's still a huge amount of um, uh, art and data science around picking your model, picking the size of your model, uh, and basically doing the, uh, uh, the tricks or that are... Or maybe he did like overfitting or something. That well, exactly. And so I was going to say hyper-optimization, right? So there's the entire idea of trying to find learn. the fit size. Um, learn so they, uh, or, uh, you know, these guys have also written their own framework. So one of the questions that often gets asked is, this is all well and good, but I want to do this, and I don't know enough of the math to write everything from scratch. You know, can I do this with Spark? And when I asked these guys that, they said, well, we've been doing this since 2011. We wrote every single line of code ourselves from scratch. So, um, you know, it's their algorithms and exactly how they're fitting things, how they're doing, you know, data cleaning may be different from what you might find in a standard library. Um, so, um, what you end up needing for this system is both um, the high throughput with thousands of training items, right? Since this is all about finding an audience, you have to have enough data to actually do that kind of audience selection, so you're going to need high throughput. But you also have that idea of thousands of concurrent models. What's interesting about what these guys are doing, like we saw in that earlier slide, is in 2011 going from a few audiences to trying to go to thousands of audiences. And uh, what you guys said in the webinar that was really compelling was allowing every single um, uh, advertiser, basically media buyer, to be able to choose that audience themselves and watch as that audience evolves. Um, I, I honestly don't know anyone working with uh, this, this level of fine grade audience selection, and it's a it's pretty interesting uh, technique for that. <clears throat> so the point of this is if you are gonna do this number of models, you do need a fast database. So I've run into people who try to do this kind of problem of online learning, and usually the first thing they do is they pick up S3. Because, you know, well, they're probably in Amazon, right? And each one of these models is, depending on the kind of model, the number of data points, uh, the, the size of an individual model, um, what you guys told me was you're doing about five meg per model. Um, a lot of other people uh, who I talk to end up using larger models, things in the 20 meg to 30 meg size. Well, if you have that number of models and you start doing the math, you've actually got a pretty hard database problem. Another way to think about that, uh, the, basically the data flow architecture and the physical model of machines, is you've got this huge cloud of compute servers. Because one thing we know about machine learning is it's very compute intensive. And so when you're doing model changes, you need to update a version of that model on all of those compute servers pretty quickly. Because if some of it's running an old model, some of it's running a new model, you don't end up having the right kinds of feedback loop, right? So you want to get that model out to all of the compute servers quickly. 
In order to do that, when a model changes, you need to go, all those machines need to go back to the centralized database and pull it. Um, if you're using something like TensorFlow, TensorFlow actually has a pretty fancy system for doing exactly this. They essentially have a shared cache among all the different servers that are compute servers. And when there's an update on any one of them, because the micro batch has caused an update, they're actually able to ripple through and, and uh, basically push the models to every single server. However, if you don't have that kind of system and you're trying to use an off-the-shelf database, an off-the-shelf framework, you need a fair amount of database horsepower. Um, now, one question that I got asked in Japan, for those of you who know Aerospike, is Aerospike has a native object size limit of about one megabyte per row. So how do you fit five megabyte objects in a database that has a one megabyte limit? And the answer is you have to slice it up. And you know, in some sense, I'm sorry. Uh, we need, at Aerospike, need to create a library for this. Um, but you can sort of imagine how the implementation is going to look. Uh, your teams, uh, they complained about this. And they said it took them, I think, uh, three or four weeks to really get their library working exactly right. Yeah, yeah it was about two sprints. We were able to do the sharding on our own side, so we can split it up um, across multiple objects. Right, so what you end up having is you end up having one very small record. And that one very small record has in it essentially a model ID and a current version and the size. So by concatenating those three things, you end up having a set of different smaller objects and you've basically broken the large thing up into a small thing, into a set of small things. Now, the one benefit of the Aerospike architecture within that kind of approach is you can do a batch get of all of those things at the same time from multiple servers. So as your cluster size grows, you actually end up having uh, higher and higher uh, throughput uh, and essentially very similar uh, response characteristics even though this uh, cluster size is growing as opposed to having you know, one machine that's getting uh, more and more, uh, taking all of the load itself. Now you will get latency issues, right, because jitter is magnified when you have to go to a lot of different servers. Um, but on the other hand, you get uh, pretty high performance. So uh, part of the um, our architecture here is a fairly standard thing that I see in the advertising industry, which is you do need to have replication across, uh, geographic replication across uh, the US uh, or different countries if you're in different countries. Um, so Airspike has a feature called XDR that allows you to basically sync these. And they're sync, they're sunk, they're sank, sank, sunk, sunk. Uh, they are synced asynchronously. So when you do a particular write, that write will then propagate to the different data centers within you know, a second or two, essentially. So you do have to be a little careful about where those writers are and where those batch updates occur. Um, you want to take over and talk about monitoring a little bit? Because you guys were pretty passionate about it. Sure, I mean, I mean the key is to make sure that all these, these uh, models are actually operating and actually we're actually scoring them appropriately. And this is a fairly new technology we started diving into probably, I guess, in the past year um, that we really started implementing in our development environment. Um, we're pretty close to going production. We have about 500, almost close to 800 models uh, ready uh, using the uh, kind of machine learning, online learning uh, methodology. Um, our goal is looking at thousands to ten thousands uh, coming into the next year. The, I mean, uh, it's, so the, the important part is, is that we don't just throw a bunch of models out there and then hope that everything is working fine and we start kind of scoring them at random. So we developed a, a bit of our own tools. We call that, I'm not sure, the full deck here, but I'll go to the next. Um, so the, so there, there are different components that are involved that we, we did from uh, from the actual application side. So I mean, we have uh, from our Java side, we're actually see in real time kind of that J meter, J, Java has uh, checking out what segments are actually present. There's multiple teams that are involved um, through this whole process. We have uh, we have our developers that are that are based uh, out of Israel that do write the application itself. But our data science team is located here in New York, and they're the ones that actually deploy it into production and then actually monitor to make sure that everything is acting appropriately. Um, we we built kind of our own. And this is this is probably data. We actually did a big. Um, online learning adaptive audience uh, day at, at Nielsen uh, earlier this week, um, and so we've kind of we've uh, improved the deck a bit. So this is a, a few a few iterations uh, uh, behind, but we built our own uh, kind of BS bot, uh, which is our kind of data science bot that does a lot of the. Uh, we can actually make the manual changes uh, for our models from here, 
and essentially updating configuration files that are sitting in S3 that will be propagated down to all of our surveying extreme servers that we have that are actually scoring the models. And we're able to monitor in there and see how the traffic is flowing um, and make sure we're getting the right amount of volume and then be able to ensure that it's actually uh, acting appropriately. Um, so there were a couple questions earlier that I'd uh, like to uh, repeat now that you're here. Um, one is, so that initial slide about seeds, uh, how does an individual uh, campaign manager select the seeds? Do they have, uh, what does it look like and what are they really choosing? Um, I mean, uh, essentially we, we were actually ingesting some of the, the data that from their published site. We do our picking matching and we're actually in, ingesting and seeing some of the attributes that are associated with it. So you can actually, essentially creating that, that seed of, of attributes that you're gonna use in the system. We're, we're currently in the process of integrating into our, our cool DMP, where it's kind of a self-managed data management platform that they can actually um, see what's actually available and actually select those to actually start seeding your audience. So, so do you see like a list of behaviors? Do you see? Yes, yeah, so you can. If you, if you go back to the, the other, you can see kind of the some of the aspects that yeah. You can see some of the aspects of the behaviors for those particular um, objects that you you know for each unique user. So you are seeing things like like this. Yes. Um, unique user. Yeah, each, each, so with the narrow spy gaze, we always call it objects, but uh, yeah, it's, it's each uh, kind of, we don't do any within our division within uh, Nielsen, we don't do any PII, so it's all, you know, unique user um, base. We have, I guess, roughly about nine, nine billion now. I think we, we grew uh, dramatically over the past few months. Um, and it's mostly the US and uh, uh, Europe. Um, we have a, our- is not a person, it could be a device, right? Could be a device. Crosswise, yeah, it's uh, uh, we, we're doing a bit more on the kind of stitching within a household to uh, kind of establish that as a household between the interconnectivity between devices in, but you're correct, it's a device. So our, our TTL, I think, is uh, currently we're set about uh, 30 days, so we have to constantly see that user or unique device uh, in order to establish it within our database. <laughs> um, so one que another question was, how, how long do you end up sort of watching a campaign um, uh, before you end up taking it online? Um, or while watching an audience? Well, it really depends on the, the actual advertiser itself. I mean, for our flow and process, um, you, you know, we're, we're scoring you know, trillions of uh, models on a regular basis, and we're training it based on a, a slide of the last uh, you know, subset of maybe 10,000 events in order to get that model set for, for an advertiser to use. Um, it really depends on the advertiser once they're ready. We, we were working on kind of our, our kind of analysis, one of our products is kind of the, uh, the measurement to be able to actually see in real time if we're actually seeing users being converted as they, after they've launched their campaign so they can tune and tweak it. But, I mean, we're talking, you know, weeks to months, but it really depends on the analysis they want to do before launching. So uh, what are the cases in which um, online really works, right? So this, this is going back to the question of, um, in some cases, online doesn't really matter because you have slow-moving audiences and slow-moving changes. Um, well, Cyber Monday, right? So you've got that period of time where um, people are suddenly online and suddenly in this Monday shopping mood, and it may be very different from how they've behaved a week uh, a month or you know, sometime back in October. So if you're doing your analysis and audience selection based on those periods, and you're not taking into account what's happening on a hour by hour basis through say Cyber Monday, when there's sales coming online, and you know, that's, that comes into this point, which is dynamic pricing. If you have an audience, uh, sorry, a, a marketplace that dynamically prices, you may have different um, advertisements and different audiences that are changing dynamically as they're seeing prices. So for that reason, you do really want to be able to change your audience in, uh, in, in this kind of real-time fashion. Um, so th that should give you uh, uh, some of the reasons why online really works uh, in case better than uh, doing this kind of batch analysis. The, the other part about the batch analysis, I mean, once we actually get it launched and it's out there, there's still, we need to refresh the model. I mean, once those things change, I think on average it probably takes us about, if we, have, you know, if we have the resources for that model, it might take five to seven days to, in order to kind of reevaluate the data, refresh and make sure it's still accurate. But the great part about the kind of online is it's constantly tuning and adapting itself. So we don't, you know, save our resources on that side, but also the amount of time it takes to keep it up to date. Great, 
so uh, that's the prepared portion of the talk. Uh, you guys have been uh, very nicely asking questions as you go through, but uh, you have an expert that's been doing uh, online machine learning for the last four years, so uh, I suggest you ask some questions. Okay. In the back. Please bring up the slide. Okay. That was the slide that answered the question. Oh, it is cluster in. This is more of a sorry. This is more of the Kevin side of it from our data science team. I can definitely get back to you. So um, supervised, unsupervised was one of the part of the question. Do you have to know that? I'm not offhand about it. Kevin kind of answer these, uh, but I can definitely you know, get back to yeah, you. Yeah. So then. come up and uh, give me your card. Yep. So. I also had a question about this, uh, this batch updating and basically how to determine how fast you have to do that. Because um, if you have too short time intervals, basically consumer behavior is always very stochastic, very probabilistic. And um, I wonder, so how do you determine if you're looking at actual trends and events and not just uh, at the noise? So for example, you know, it could be influenced by, by the weather or anything we don't, we kind of control, not even those Cyber Mondays because they're more, they're more predictable. How do you know uh, the batch size you have to know before you're starting, you know, to look at nothing anymore? So we, we, I mean, we, we kind of we I mean, there's tuning to be done with it, but it's based on the kind of recent history of events. So I think if last we had it set to about ten thousand, two hundred thousand. If you look at the, yeah, I mean, essentially setting up your audience first. So you have to set up the attributes associated with the converted and non-converted, and then you come back to the lookup window once you see those users. So your lookup window is a sliding window of the last ten thousand events, and that's essentially what you're using to kind of train that. But you, these events are actually, I mean, you're talking in, you know, if we're doing, you know, trillions of scoring on models in a day, we have, I think we do something about 700 requests per second across about 200 servers. I mean, we're able to establish this in, in you know, milliseconds. Um, and we're able to replicate in less than, you know, around the second uh, period. Because where did you get the number 10,000 from? That's actually the question. 10,000. So after 10,000 events, you update, but uh, it's says tuning and tweaking. I mean, we, 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 it depends on the volume they were getting. It seemed to be, I, 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 we, it may be larger now, maybe smaller, but the, we found a kind of a sweet spot with 10,000. Um, it's just the, the recency with it. We could wait for more, and we could. And it depends on the amount of volume that matched that converted and non-converted. We have to kind of use this type of, uh, somewhat in the secret sauce of our application itself, and trying to tune some of the accuracy and confidence, because you may need to bring up a larger you know, volume of audience in order to get 10,000. You may be looking at, depending on what you choose, you may only get 1,000 in the course of, you know, a day, but you want to make sure you get a, uh, you know, the, the window quick enough to actually respond to it. The, that, I mean, that's one of the other things about, about having to do, uh, uh, originally we had started in one single region, um, or one area like in California, but we needed more volume of events, so that's when we launched it and had actually had different data centers and we used uh, Aerospike to do the replication to make sure we had that kind of persistent state with asynchronous replication. So uh, one thing that's peculiar about that, even though he says it's a tuning parameter, um, I've seen that number 100 in a whole bunch of literature. So I don't know what's special about it, but I think other people have found it too. So uh, I think one way to do that is that uh, you, you train a model using batch, using a batch method, and then, for example, like you you choose a classification model to, to classify, oh, this, this user is, uh, is, uh, I'm interested in this user or not, just a, a 1.0. And then you use that set of parameters on the uh, streaming part and to, 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 to score that user like in real time. But you're talking about, uh, so is it true that you, 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 your online part is, you use online part to retrain the model to tune it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a constant process. So, I mean, what we see today may not be the same thing we're seeing tomorrow or even throughout the course of the day. So we're training, and that's what we use our monitoring tools for, to see how these models, make sure there's not too much standard deviation of what's going on, if there is, we're able to kind of alert on it and make sure that everything is working appropriately. But yeah, I mean, we, we spend, I mean, essentially you're training it before you bring it to production, you actually launch it. So you gotta learn about your audience, you gotta learn about these attributes, and you gotta learn the other aspects of them when it comes to the features. Um, I have a follow-up question, like at which point you will rebuild the models? If like you said, like you keep like monitoring and you have like 
I mean, it's real time. It's real time monitoring. So, yeah, I mean, so we have certain alerts and thresholds that are set based on you know the typical standard. activity. Oh, okay. Is it based on standard deviation or? Um, I, it, it, it abnormalities in actual behavior. So there's some sort of you know delta that will start to trigger. So there's some sort of deviation awesome. in behavior. So my, uh, I'm having a hard time understanding what makes it different than Spark streaming versus. In, in what aspect of it? I mean, it's just a different solution. Is that what it is? I mean, yeah. I mean, but what are you, how are you using? You're saying using Spark streaming instead of using Aerospike. So, so Spark is Spark streaming is a platform. Mm -hmm. So part of what uh, they're describing here is how to actually use it, what to use it on, etc. Uh, most people, when they use Spark streaming, they could be doing model updates. Yeah. So all of this could be done with the Spark streaming. Platform. Oh, okay. So just a different system. Well, and. Uh, Four years worth of experience of actually doing this. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, yeah. Exactly. But you can do it. You sh you can okay. do it with Spark streaming. You don't have to build your own system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have plenty of experience with uh, Aerospike and you know tuning and tweaking it. I, I think that the sheer volume. I think we're one of the larger ones when it comes to volume. I'm not sure. At least we once were, but <laughs> it's been a while. But the I mean, what we've kind of tuned it for is when I mean, we look at the other use case outside of online learning is kind of our, our typical uh, you know. Uh, unique user or object or device ID uh, um, uh, flow within our application where we're ingesting users and actually getting behavior and storing it in those JSON objects within Aerospike. But the, uh, the reason we like it is because of the, uh, the, the ability to do the, uh, the cross data center replication. We were able to maintain um, with a, a less than a minute lag between sites, between all the number of transactions that we're doing on a regular basis. And then even within the site, we have, you know, obviously, I mean, it was probably in the ad tech, but the, the, uh, our SLA is about 250 milliseconds for every call that happens from a, a publisher tag into our system. And then you're talking about going through our load balancers into our serving pool, actually, and then talking to the database to see if the object exists, update it, upgrade it. All that has to happen within 250 milliseconds. So the majority of our workload, I think, is probably, you know, writes if we're adding new objects, but the, it, it, all this happens, I think 99% happens in less than four milliseconds and probably like 90 or 97 for those namespaces are less than uh, um, uh, uh, one millisecond. So, so in terms of Spark streaming, the way to think about uh, part of this is those models are shared members of the computation, right? So you're essentially thinking about uh, uh, using Spark data frames because data frame is a way to not just have uh, information from a particular shard of, an audio, uh, of a particular user, but a shared computation among multiple sources. So there's ways to do all of this. Uh, and Aerospike has a Spark connector where you can basically just do that data frame thing natively. So, so yeah, absolutely. When you're building model like, models like this, what do you consider a conversion? Um, it, conversion as in the, the actual user, if it matches, if it, if it matches the attributes of uh, the actual model. So, so for, the, for those users, it actually converted and actually purchased whatever that we're looking for. So if that user, you know, bought whatever. Oh, so, so for example, if I'm an advertiser and I'm an automaker, uh, you know, I want to sell cars to people, and I, I know there is some people interested, and then when they buy a car of my brand, then that's what we will call a conversion. Yeah, if we, it's a set of attributes that you're seeding into there. So it's, it's essentially, yeah, it's whatever. If, if they're buying your car, these are the attributes just to the converted user. They convert it after some sort of advertisement. And so we can look at that user and see whatever other aspects of this unique user, anonymous to us, but you can see the other attributes associated. And if they bought like a, a car from a different brand, will we also it depends on, a conversion? It depends on how you set up. So it's so up to the, up. yeah, you could say just any car. You could say, hey, you know, Toyota Prius or whatever it may be, but yeah. So, so this goes back to, in machine learning, you need to have a metric. And so in advertising, uh, conversion can mean a number of things. It could mean buying a product, but probably not for cars, because people don't tend to buy their cars online, so it's going to be very hard to match pizza. that conversion, yeah. right? So um, that's sort of where you get back to brand advertising. Cars tend to do a lot of brand advertising. They just want, you know, Nissan and a beautiful sunny day, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no conversion. They just want it in front of your eyeballs. So you don't have that kind of metric. Um, Whereas if, if a click could be a metric. So in car buying, if you put up a ad and, and your advertiser has said, um, well, the ad says, you know, click here for more information. 
and then a click is a conversion because you know, you know that that particular uh, uh, person is interested in information about your car, you've driven them to that point, then you've got an online behavior that you can actually match with all of this stuff. So conversion could mean clicks, it often does, that's CPC, CPM, or it could mean buy if you're for, further down the funnel, but probably not for cars. Right, not for cars. What about concept testing? Sorry, what about? Do concept testing, like let's say, you, like the, if you're a media buyer, you use your, find out the model to see if a certain campaign will work. So let's say you're, develop, you're developing a TV show and you want to know if it will attract a certain type of audience. Can you run campaigns on concepts or test that, that ideas and stuff like that? Um, I don't know that many people doing that kind of stuff, honestly. I mean, this is mostly uh, advertising use, right? Right, right. Um, okay. But I, I've always wanted to do that, because uh, just a quick side story. Um, uh, in a previous company, I actually got a, um, um, a, uh, a set-top box installed in Larry Ellison's bedroom, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to see when they click, well, when he would click away from or into different channels. Right? That's exactly what you want to know if you're designing a video ad. Was there something about a certain transition or a certain image that caused certain audiences to move in or out? As far as I know, nobody's doing that. And there's it's always an area Boston. of great interest. There's a startup in Boston doing it. Sorry? What? There's a startup in Boston doing it. They've got there connect is? sensors. They've got like 10,000 units deployed or so. And they got connect sensors and they know what's on TV and they track the user what they're doing. Right. Yeah, I, I've always just wanted to do it on channel up, channel down, because the set-top box knows that, and it's yeah. synchronized in video stream. Yeah, so they know whether or not someone's like using the device or like even looking at the TV. Mm -hmm. So people are starting to do that. Um, but this is really mostly about a, a sort of simple online use, and as far as I know, isn't commonly used uh, uh, by Nielsen, for example, for that kind of TV use. Uh, question there? You've been patient, so. You mentioned you know, having a PII, personal identifiable information, but you're trying to match devices versus uh, like a home IP. Uh, Facebook's going to start doing matching advertising uh, to set-top boxes uh, to say like, okay, like your Roku, you're watching an ad um, and whatnot. So are you guys going to try and tie into that um, and maybe even influence like what's, if you have um, targeted advertising for uh, video streams? Yeah, we, 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 are, I mean, we are working with uh, Roku on it, um, or at least we have. Um, so we can actually tie in based on uh, what they're doing, advertisements that are streamed um, based on what's happening in that household. So I don't know if they're actually in production with this uh, app or anybody's using it just yet, but it's definitely in our, in our development. Yeah, but a very common use case is more and more people move away from kind of the syndicated cable into uh, more of the, uh, the you know, Netflix and Hulu and everything else online. But for the TV stuff, yeah, there's definitely a lot more development. With the Nielsen, obviously, a very large company, they, they have a whole watch division that deals strictly with the, on the TV side of it. So, you know, the ability to kind of stitch some of this, this data together, if we can establish, you know, kind of that unique uh, ID or that index between could, you know, do quite a bit um, when you're looking at advertisers to try to customize those campaigns. Again there? Yeah, so for the uh, there are thousands of models running at the same time? Are they for different users or for different features or even <coughs> to answer different yeah, questions? They, yeah, I mean, it's uh, different users. I mean, it's different publishers and uh, clients of ours. So, I mean, we were building out these models to figure out those associations, but it, yeah, not just uh, one. More questions? Okay, it seems like we sort of Come to a lull here, David. All right, so if that's it for the questions, then I want to say thank you very much, Brian Wilkowski, Brent Keeter. Also, we have a little bit of extra swag. Feel free to just grab it away. Yeah, thanks for coming out on a cold evening. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's thanks. 21 degrees, guys. Thank you all. Yes. Seriously. Thank you.